This is a somewhat busy slide, but I think it's very important. This is a wonderful study from Carol Caraccio, published in Acnet Medicine almost 10 years ago. And I want to highlight the column on the right that really shows the differences in a competency-based system versus a structured process system or our old traditional model. A couple things worth highlighting. You'll notice that the driving force for the process of learning needs to be the learner, not the teacher. The learner has to take on a much more active role in a competency-based system, which I actually think is a very good thing. You'll notice that the path of learning, which traditionally has been hierarchical, it's kind of like a teacher filling up students as if they were a vessel pouring knowledge into them, now becomes much more non-hierarchical, where the teacher and student become partners, working with each other to figure out how to fill gaps and help the person progress most effectively. And the responsibility for the content has to be shared. The goal of the educational counter is not so much acquiring knowledge, it's now applying knowledge. That becomes a very important distinction. And with regard to assessment tools, we need things that are much more objective where possible, but more importantly, they need to be authentic. They need to mimic the real task of what people are actually going to do. And we need to get away from using what I call proxies, or what Carol calls proxies, such as if they can present a patient at morning report, they must have been able to take a good history and physical. What we've learned from research is that's just not true. And so more authentic assessment would be you go and watch them with a the patient taking a history and physical instead of having them tell you how that history and physical went. The setting for evaluation is less removed or gestalty, but now based on more direct observation, right? Again, you watch what they do. And more importantly, instead of using a norm referenced framework for evaluation such as, well, you know, compared to Carol, Joe seems to be doing pretty well and is about the same level. You would instead compare Joe and Carol to a criterion reference standard. What is it they should be able to do? So for example, from shared decision making, we know that there are certain behaviors on the part of the physician that make it more likely a patient will adhere to therapy. Did Joe or Carol actually do those behaviors? That becomes the most important piece. And all this may feel somewhat paradoxical. The competency-based system relies much more on formative assessment, that type of assessment that's used to provide feedback, than on summative assessment. An example of some assessment would be the board certification exam that my organization delivers. I certainly don't want to wait until somebody's taken three years of training to find out on a multiple choice exam that they don't have sufficient knowledge and the ability to use that knowledge to be a physician. Formative assessment done much earlier in the process should have made that determination much earlier. And it's not only fair for the trainee, but actually make sure that trainee reaches the highest competence they possibly can. And as I mentioned before, variable time is a possibility in competency-based education, but I don't think right now it's the thing that should receive our greatest emphasis. I think what's most important about this shift is that we measure what people are actually doing and are able to tell the public that when we graduate somebody, they are truly ready to enter unsupervised practice because the assessments and the curriculum are well aligned with the competencies they need to be effective independent physicians. Now another way to think about this and the importance of assessment comes from George Miller's uh, famous assessment pyramid. At the bottom of that pyramid is knowledge. That's the foundational thing that we all need to know. As I like to tell people, you can't have an empty hard drive. A Homer Simpson-like hard drive just isn't going to cut it. And so knowledge is still important and we can measure that with a multiple choice exam. And we can actually do that quite well. In other techniques in these exams like extended matching or critical response questions can also get at whether or not the person knows how to do something. Shows how type assessments are very important and they're being used routinely particularly among medical students. And these are the standardized patients and other types of simulation. They tell us if somebody has the capacity or the capability to actually do particular skills or have particular knowledge. But what's most important is what they do. That's called performance. When they're caring for patients in the actual clinical care context, can they take care of those patients effectively? And so faculty observation that was highlighted on the previous table from Carol Caraccio is critical. And although some people have put faculty observation under shows how, I believe it sits at the top of the pyramid 
And more importantly, if we think about that pyramid now as the tip of a spear, guess who's at the tip of that spear? It's a patient. So how well we observe, how well we assess our trainees is absolutely critical. So with that kind of background of what competency-based microeducation is and the definitions of it, let's now think a little bit more about evaluation frameworks and language. Why is this important? Well, one of the things that challenges all of us is we often don't have a shared understanding that some of this language or these terminologies or frameworks are very difficult for all of us to kind of have a shared understanding. And so that's an important next step to fully realize the potential of a competency-based system. So let's explore some of those. Let's start with a simple definition. What exactly is a framework? Well, this is right out of Webster's dictionary. It's simply a skeletal or structural frame, a basic structure such as of ideas, and finally it serves as a frame of reference. And I think this last one, frame of reference, is very important for us. We need to be able to have a frame of reference that we can go back to to make sense of the things we observe our trainees doing and make sense of the information and data about their performance. And as Marvin Dunn pointed out, the ACGME competencies are simply a framework or frame of reference for education assessment. They are the organizing principles to frame our discussion and to design our curriculum. This is the ACGME or ABMS framework well known to all of us. These are the six general competencies and recently as you know procedural skills was added to the patient care competency. But these are the six general competencies we use as our framework for both training and now for maintenance of certification by all 24 of the specialty boards. There are other frameworks that sometimes can be helpful. None of these are mutually exclusive and they can actually be kind of mixed and matched to meet particular needs. I'm going to walk through each of these is just kind of some background that hopefully will give you, again, some kind of frames of reference that will help you make sense of what you're trying to do, particularly when assessing your trainees. Let's start with the KSA, or Knowledge, Skills, and Attitude Framework. This is what Lou Pangaro would call an analytic framework. We break apart the competency into smaller component parts. K equals knowledge, S equals skill, and you can see on the slide there, there's some examples of what those skills might be, such as information gathering skills, ability to use that knowledge, such as clinical judgment, and management skills. And then finally, attitudes are very important, such as professionalism and humanism. So this is, again, a particular type of framework that can be very helpful in breaking apart certain competencies to get a better understanding of them. The RIME model is also a helpful model that's been used particularly for medical students on clinical clerkships. It was developed by Lou Pangaro and Gordon Hall in the 1980s, and it was developed at the Uniformed Services University of the Health Science to help them evaluate students during their clinical clerkships in the third and fourth year. Lou refers to this as a synthetic model, where he pulls together particular elements to provide a developmental kind of evaluation of the student. So for example, reporter is a medical student who can collect an accurate history and physical and report that information back in a coherent, efficient frame to the attendings or the team. That would be a reporter. And for Lou, a third year medical student on their clerkship must be able to reach the reporter level in order to pass the rotation. An interpreter is now somebody who can not only collect and, make, and, and report back the information, but they can now make sense of it. They can interpret what the information tells them about the patient, such as be able to create at least a general differential diagnosis for common conditions. A manager is somebody who can then take that interpretation and begin to at least develop a draft plan for what you might do for that patient, how you might treat them, what antibiotic you might use, for example, for pneumonia, what tests might be needed for this patient to complete the workup. And a really high-functioning student is somebody who can educate others on the team relative to the patient in front of them. Very few students will actually reach this level. And in Lou's system, people who reach the manager level are considered honor students in their third year. Now, these are helpful frameworks, but for us in residency and fellowship training, we probably need to bump them up one additional level. 